consider this morning the resurrection. I'm sure you almost expected that. It's a great theme, is it not? And a theme that's worthy of all the attention we can give it. And to that end, we'll look at verses 1 through 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as the Apostle Paul tells us how this resurrection was the transforming power in his own life and in the life of the first century and it built churches some must be months ago now we watched the film on um, Lee Strobel's conversion the case for Christ and like so many people who've tried to ignore the resurrection he found that when he went to study it the result was that he experienced what the Bible calls being born again or the first resurrection he was a a writer for the Chicago Tribune and his wife got converted much to his displeasure so he set about disproving her newfound beliefs he studied he tells us the gospel accounts for two years until one day he was sitting reading it afresh and if you want in human language the penny dropped we know it was a work of God's grace whereby his spirit the light of the gospel shone into his heart and Lee Strobel like so many men and women who've been affected by the gospel became one of its primary advocates I'd recommend his books to you they're freely available from Christian bookstores and if you want the film is really worth watching if you're part of the church here I still have it if you want to borrow it and refresh your memory of the content of the story the resurrection not only changed the world in which it happened it's been the power of God changing the world ever since and it's still at work and as we today look at the poverty of our Christian witness in the world what, what really needs to happen is we need to realize the significance of the resurrection and to be looking for ways to bring people to attend to it and see it for themselves from the passage that's before us I want to consider the resurrection from three angles first of all in the church because that's where Paul begins secondly as it is a fulfillment of the scriptures and then thirdly to look at the witnesses who tell us these events first of all then in the church moreover brethren verse 1 I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you which also you received and in which you stand by which you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain the gospel as Paul will go on to explain in verses 3 and 4 was a, a description of God's great love seen in sending his son into the world in Christ's amazing love in allowing himself to be executed as a common criminal in God the Spirit's great power in that on the third day as promised he was raised from the dead truly to look at the resurrection is to be challenged in every aspect of your world there's nothing like it anywhere else all major religions have a tomb at which you can visit the remains of their founder Christianity has an empty tomb and that empty tomb is the message which is being declared here in the passage and which I hope to communicate to you this morning let's remember that the men and women who, all, who saw the crucifixion had no real concept of the resurrection tonight we'll look at John 20 God willing and then there John just writes the comment as he's writing the gospel account with the benefit of hindsight that when it happened they were not expecting the resurrection it's a phenomena that doesn't happen as the world says when you're dead you're dead except 
if you're Jesus. And the great truth is, except if you're a child of God through Jesus, you too will rise. But I'm running ahead of myself. That little group of 11 men and those humble women who were around the cross, there was probably one or two others, were so terrified that they locked themselves up to hide away from the authorities. But then they meet the risen Christ, and from meeting the risen Christ, they become ambassadors for the kingdom of God, declaring fearlessly, prepared to give their lives as James did, and as Peter almost did, preparing to die. There was a little picture on the internet this week, which was by Charles Coulson, and it caught my attention. And it, it, it said the resurrection must be true, because you have this group of 11 men and these women who for 40 years were prepared to stand their ground and hold fast to it. And he compared it to the Watergate um, carry on in America. And he says at the Watergate you had a group of 40 men who couldn't keep a secret for three weeks. But one of the great truths of Christianity is that Christ is risen. It's the crowning proof of Christianity and once it sunk into these men and women's lives they were unstoppable in fact the only reason there's a church here in Middleton today is because Jesus rose from the dead I have no interest in religious philosophy in fact reading aloud the scriptures again Paul makes it very clear if there's no resurrection of the dead then Christ is not risen and if Christ is not risen our preaching is empty and your faith is also vain you see the resurrections at the heart of the gospel message Paul says twice he preached to them, verse 1 and verse 2. The word preached in the New Testament is a helpful word to, to get your head around what was happening. It is a word which described the herald. And in the first century world, they didn't have Facebook. You can hardly imagine that. They didn't have Twitter. There was no other way to pass on information than to send out somebody to tell people. And the herald's job... We sometimes have them, don't we? We've even seen them in Pickering with the bell and the red coat. Red coat. They go out and they say, Oh, yay, oh, yay, listen. The, the authorities want you to know this. Paul uses the word for a herald to describe what he was doing. He had been commissioned by King Jesus. He had met him on the road to Damascus. He had been going to put the Christians in prison. To kill them, to silence this lie, when the Lord of glory said, stand up, I'm commissioning you to be my herald to the world. And here we have Paul making it clear to the Corinthians that he's there to preach the gospel. Now it's important that you, 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 you grasp how Paul did this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 3 he says, I was with you in weakness, in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's the power of God. That's the almighty reality of what we're looking at here. The apostle had ended up in Corinth after being jailed and beaten in Philippi, chased out of Thessalonica, moved on from Athens. And then God gave him a little group of believers in that ancient city of Corinth. Acts 18 tells the story. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks and when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. And that includes this message we're looking at this morning. That Jesus is the one 
who has accomplished all that God had planned to bring about the redemption of his people. Run your eye down to verse 3 because here we get a description of Paul's gospel. And can I just stop for a minute? You see, sometimes we use the word gospel and we think it only describes what happened on the cross. That's not the case in the Bible. I understand why we've gone there and emphasized it. But the, the Bible message was not only that Jesus died on the cross. Thousands of people did that. The Bible message is three days later, he was up, up alive, walking around, could be touched, talked to, felt, ate. He's a real saviour who's come back from the dead. So listen as Paul explains to them what he preached or reminds them of what he preached. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. We'll stop there and come back to the witnesses later. But here is the nub of Paul's message. He didn't simply preach an exemplary life in Christ. He didn't simply preach a heroic um, self-sacrifice. His message was those things were true, but they were the precursor, the forerunner to this great truth that Jesus, who died on that cross, is actually alive. Romans 14, 9. To this end, Christ died and rose and lived again that he might be lord both of the living and the dead romans 4 25 he was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised again because of our justification i love that verse in romans 4 25 what's he really saying what's the nub of this Okay, Jesus died for our sins, but how do we know that God accepted that sacrifice and that he can take away my sin? Because he was alive again on the third day. Jesus' resurrection was for our justification, to, to, to bring us to that place of being at peace with God because our sins have been paid for and we have been saved look carefully at these words listen to them again he speaks to people who've heard the gospel and they've received it and run back to verse 5 verse 1 of chapter 15 i declare to you the gospel which i preached to you which also you received and in which you stand and by which you are also saved. It's personal not only for Paul, but for every believer who hears it and knows the powerful working of God the Holy Spirit to convict them of sin and of judgment and of righteousness and to bring them into the kingdom of God through new birth. The words themselves are interesting. In the Greek language, the verbs actually take on distinctive characteristics and Paul uses the first verb in verse 1 received to describe something which happened at a point in time earlier on in 1st Corinthians he says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but he says to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. These people had experienced and acknowledged that they were lost. They had experienced and acknowledged that they were condemned before a holy God. But they had also experienced and now enjoy the great truth that God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life that's your possession today if you're a christian you've not entered yet into the fullness of it but everlasting life starts now he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me 
Saviour says, John chapter 5, hath, is what the old, old authorised version says, H-A-T-H. And that again is a specific Greek tense, which means you've got it right now. Hath everlasting life. And that's why Christian functions as they do. That's why we are different to the world around us. It's not only that we've been intellectually informed. There's been a new heart given. A heart which loves God, which wants God, which will serve God if it possibly can. That's why you don't need a big stick to drive Christians to church. Those who belong to Christ want to meet with his people, want to join together in praise. That's why you don't need a big stick to, 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 to make Christians live Christian lives. They know that though they're not in other people's company, they're continually in his company. Oh dear friends, what a joy it is to be a Christian. What a joy it is. It wasn't all smooth in Corinth when Paul was preaching in the synagogue, Acts 18. The, the ruler of the synagogue got converted and it caused a riot. He was ejected from the synagogue. Did he stop preaching? No. He moved to the house next door and preached more and more and more. That's the pattern of the New Testament. That's what you and I should be looking for as Christians in the present day. The gospel hasn't changed. The power of God is no less today than it ever has been. And therefore, as you look upon our smallness and the difficulty of working the work of God today, what are you and I to do about it? There are two options. It will drive you to despair. Or it will drive you to prayer. And for me, there is actually only one option. Why are you cast down within me, O my soul? That's what we read on Thursday night, wasn't it? Hope thou in God. Hope in God. For I shall yet be, I can't remember the exact word, but blessed is what it says, isn't it? The world in Psalm 43 and 44 was crushing that poor son of Korah. He, he was feeling dejected until God dealt with him and he talks to himself. Get it into perspective. Read your Bible. Believe your Bible. Don't believe the message of the world. The devil or the flesh. Get right back here. The church is built on the foundation of the most phenomenal event that ever took place in history. I hesitated as I thought about using that phrase because Calvary is a phenomenal event, isn't it? That Jesus, the Lord of glory, the second person of the Trinity, would allow himself to suffer and die in our place. That he would experience that separation from his Father which caused him to cry out, My God, my God. That's astounding. So really what I need to do is put the two of them together. Those three days are the most significant days that have ever taken place in history. And as Christians, you and I need, we need this in our soul. We need this as our foundation. Because it's when this message is preached and communicated that God chooses to honour it and to bring about new Christians. People can find religion everywhere. The Dalai Lama is very popular, is he not? You'll find little texts and sayings of his all over the place because it's a self-improvement course. And we're in the day of self-improvement. Look after your body, do exercises, train your mind, achieve yourself. And it's all built on the, 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 the sand foundation of evolution and Darwinism. We are improving, we are developing, we are evolving. Am I allowed to say rubbish without explaining it? Talk to me later. The Bible says, be honest. Where does all this trouble in the world come from? As somebody pointed out again, they had guns in America for 300 years. What's happened in the last 30 that they're suddenly killing each other? Our youngsters are in school. It's not the things in the world which are the problem it's the people 
How am I ever going to see that resolved? By bringing the gospel to their attention. Yes, we should feed them. Yes, we should care for them. But I'm absolutely convinced that what the world needs to hear is that Christ died for sinners and rose again on the third day. And whoever believes on him will rise with him. If you're not a Christian, dear friend, it's time you were. If you're not a Christian, you're, 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 you're sticking your head in the sand. Again, I, I get frustrated sometimes, and this is what frustrates me, that we have this gospel truth and so few people are giving it any attention. They're always trying to work out their own scheme, find their own way to God. Uh -uh. It doesn't work. I am the way. Do you remember who said it? I am the truth. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so today, go to Jesus. He'll lead you. He'll bring you and bring you to be at peace. The church then, its very existence is because Jesus rose from the dead. That's what Paul says. And what he then goes on to explain to them was, this is what the Bible always taught and expected. The Bible testimony itself should make us sit up and realize that this was God's plan from eternity. Did you notice in the passage we read, verse 5, sort of the end of verse 4, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. At the end of verse 3, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, Corinthians is one of the first books in the New Testament to be actually written. But around this time, Mark's Gospel would have been in circulation. And the whole weight of the Old Testament was present. So when Paul talks about the Scriptures, he's talking about the, the, the written life of Christ and the Old Testament. And all of these experiences taught the Jews to expect and the tragedy is you see so so blinded are they by sin that they disbelieve it and one of the challenges in the first century we don't see it so much today was that where the gospel was preached there were Jewish evangelists going around trying to undo it or trying to modify it to make it more comfortable for themselves Galatians chapter Galatians the whole book of Galatians is written about how they even managed to get Peter's ear and get James off the track. So that Paul has to take Peter to task on the matter. No, the scriptures continually spoke about the fact that Christ would rise. He was promised as a saviour in the book of Genesis chapter 3 and there are so many pictures that take me all day but let me just jump from Genesis 20 chapter 3 to, to later on in the life of Abraham who was promised the child who would bless all the nations in whose seed all the nations would be blessed that child was born in the person of Isaac and then God told him one day to take Isaac and offer him on the sacrifice can you imagine what was going through poor Abraham's mind not only the drama and the grief of having to obey God and execute his son, but what about these promises, Lord? How can they be fulfilled if Isaac's dead? And you get the account in Genesis 22 where they go with their men and the wood and the donkey. And just before Abraham goes up the mountain, it always uh, gr grasps my imagination, just before they go up the mountain, Genesis 22.5, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And then notice, and we will come back to you. That was his confidence. If I'm to, to offer him as a sacrifice, and remember he got as far as putting him on top of the wood, the knife was raised before God intervened and provided the ram. Abraham clearly believed that if Isaac died, God would need to bring him back from the dead. But that wasn't to be the role of Isaac, was it? That's Jesus' role. That's for years later down the road. People are familiar with the great passage in Isaiah 53, aren't they? 
of the crucifixion of Christ. But in there, the resurrection is underlined. Verse 9, they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Joseph of Arimathea too. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Now listen, when you make his soul an offering for our sin, he shall see his deeds, his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. You notice the promise, the one who is to be the sacrifice will see the outcome. He'll be aware and involved in what was to happen. Psalm 16 verses 9 and 10, Peter repeats it in Acts chapter 2 as he's preaching. My heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. It's a good exercise for you this afternoon. If you've got a concordance, dig into that Old Testament and see how often it came up when the Lord himself was speaking in Matthew chapter 12 and trying to explain what was to come, the resurrection. He, he, he goes to the story of Jonah and he tells us that's a picture of resurrection. He was swallowed by the great fish. He was spewed up and three days later and became God's agent for salvation to many. And so Paul links himself in with what the Bible had been teaching. Again, you need to just pause and think. Remember, Paul was a, a Jewish rabbi, a Pharisee. He had been reading and studying the Old Testament all his life. He probably had an armful of degrees on the Old Testament. But it was only when he met Jesus on that road to Damascus that it all suddenly made sense that it all suddenly became reality he now could look at his old testament and he could see how they anticipated the resurrection of jesus we we're going through Acts normally on a Sunday morning, chapter 13, when Paul preaches, remember, he takes them back through the Old Testament and he shows them it was talking about Jesus. God knew there would never be a human being who could bring about what needed to be brought about, the complete revolution of a soul, and therefore he has planned to come himself as a real human being, as a real human being, to suffer and die for us. And through that suffering and death to bring about redemption. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. That little word received needs to be underlined. It's a, a technical word in ancient Greek. It means getting a tradition and passing it on. He, he's pointing out to these people, this is not something I came up with. This has always been God's word. And it was entrusted to me. And again, if you read Galatians, it fits in very well with this. He tells us he, he didn't consult immediately with Peter and James and the folk in, in Jerusalem. No, Paul was in the desert for three years. And it was there that the Lord of glory taught him what he had been missing from his Old Testament. It was there that he realized that Jesus Christ is God, that Jesus Christ is the one who has died and risen from the dead. And even as Paul had this message to uh, passed on to him, it has been passed on to us through him and through other saints down through the ages. And it's our privilege this morning to, to share this message with one another for our encouragement. And to recognize that the, the way the world will be changed is by getting this message into their hands, their hearts, and their minds. For the word of God is sharp and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, says the writer of Hebrews, dividing apart the soul and the spirit, getting right to the heart of men. When Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 2, quoting the word of God, the Old Testament, we are told that the Jews were pierced in their hearts. For Lydia, it was just an event in her mind. 
She heard the gospel and realised it was true, but let's see the picture. When the Holy Spirit applies the word, it's what he's been doing in generation after generation after generation. So let's be, how can you be humbly proud at the same time? Contradiction, isn't it? We need to be gracious is probably the way to say it. And draw people's attention to the reality, to the great truth that the one who was definitely dead, certified dead by a Roman centurion, and then just to make sure he was dead, pierced in the ribs with a spear. He was as dead as a dead man can be. Wrapped up in a shroud, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, take him and lay him in a tomb. It's Friday night, Sabbath is coming. And he lay there in that tomb on the Sabbath again. That's something that often intrigues me, you see. When God created the world, remember, he did it in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. I see a picture. On the seventh day, after Jesus has formulated and put everything in place to create the new creation, he rested. And on the third day, he rose again. He's God. Come to establish a new kingdom, a new people, most definitely and certainly alive. And the traditions which have been received are not just made up stories. It's not a game of Chinese whispers as the world so often wants to rubbish it by. Take time to study. Be like Lee Strobel. This is vitally important. If I'm wrong, the worst that is going to happen is I'm going to have a great life here and lie in my grave. But if an unbeliever is wrong, do I need to lay it out for you? He's going to have forever to remember that they were wrong. And it's going to be hell to him. Or her. Jesus rose from the dead. That's the testimony of Scripture. That's the message of the church. Let me get to my last point because you need to see these witnesses. The resurrection is established in the witnesses. Verse 6, after that, well, maybe go back a bit. And he was buried, verse 4, and that he rose again the third day, and then verse 5, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. Of course, Cephas is Peter. And the significance here, you see, is that Peter was the one who denied him, wasn't he? And it's interesting that Paul puts him in there, first point. The man that least deserved to know that Jesus was alive was right at the top of Jesus' list for establishing it. He was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Let those words move you in your heart and mind. These people literally saw Jesus alive. Thomas, you remember, was missing the first Sunday night. And the following Sunday he was there and the Lord of glory appears. Does he tear a strip off Thomas? No, he says, look Thomas, here's the wounds, put your finger in. My body is real. I've come back from the dead. And then that glorious account, isn't it, where they're fishing and the Lord prepares breakfast for them. At the end of John 21. And in that passage what you get is this picture of him enjoying the fish along with the fishermen. He came back with a real body. And he was seen by over 500 brethren. Who were they? Paul knew who they were. He's quite happy to say of whom the greater part remain to the present. That surely has to be one further great proof of the resurrection. I could tell you all kinds of stories and dream up a crowd of people who saw it. But, but if there was just one individual who, who, who knew I was lying, I'm exposed. Paul says 500. 
When did the 500 see him? Uh, I began by reading from Matthew's Gospel, uh, the account. And you remember they were told to go into Galilee because he would meet them there. And it's in Galilee that they're commissioned to go to all the world. And we're told there's a great crowd round him in Galilee. 120 were saved on the day of Pentecost, weren't they? And then just days later, others were saved. There were lots of people around back then who knew that this was not only a great and awesome revelation of God's love, but that it was and is real. Even as Jesus has said it would be. And therefore, the world has changed forever. Some of them have fallen asleep, it says here. Death is no longer death. If I had read the whole chapter, we'd talk about death losing its sting. And for the Christian, you see, death is transformed from being the end to being going to sleep. We believe that we will rise again. I've said it so many times, I'm afraid I might bore you. But the word cemetery comes from a Greek word which means a resting or a sleeping place. And if you'll notice, I found one or two exceptions, most cemeteries have the headstones facing east. And that's because of those scriptures which talk about Christ's return being from the east, rising with the sun. You see, the Christian hope has been transformed. The things we are talking about this morning are the one great reality that nobody really should be able to deny after that he was seen by James this James is not James or not John's brother he's distinguished here from the apostles this is the Lord Jesus half brother remember who mocked him and laughed at him while he was alive but he saw Jesus there are my words. And that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And so James becomes a leader in the church in Jerusalem. Until he's executed by Herod. It's very important then to go down to Paul himself, see his humility. The sworn enemy of the resurrection. The one that thought these Christians were off the rocker. And they were threatening the stability and, and freedom of the Jews. I became a believer. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called apostle. What are you talking about Paul? Because I persecuted the church of God. I was the church's number one enemy. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I laboured more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but it was the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Christian, I need to pull these things to a close. The scriptures are just so full of encouragement regarding the resurrection. And... I need to be encouraged in the great truth of the resurrection and to prayerfully believe that this is the key to filling these empty seats. This is the key to transforming Middleton, Pickering, Rydale. This is the key to bringing the order back into society that we're all moaning about. It's not like it was when we were children. Why has the change come in? Because people are no longer believing that Jesus rose. Christianity is shoved off to the side. And now we have what they call secular thinking. This month's Evangelical Times has a scary article about a government minister who's determined even to come into churches and remove from us the right to teach our children the gospel. How will that ever stop? Well, the good news is they tried before. And just when it gets to the most desperate moment, 
the message of the resurrection comes in. Up pops John and Charles Wesley into a society where the established church has left the gospel behind. In Scotland, up pop various preachers. His name's just gone right out of my head, but the, the young man who was Robert Murray McShane in Edinburgh, who was on fire for the Lord. And he went to Israel to visit and his friend Mr. Burns took over his church in Dundee and God sent revival. When the gospel is preached, look out. Like Mr. Spurgeon said, defend the Bible, I'd rather defend a lion. Let it free. Almost holy brothers and sisters, can I encourage you today in the great, real, vital truth that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he is alive today in you and through you in your world. Amen.